One hit KO moves or Oko moves can turn the tide of a match instantly simply by doing exactly as they advertise and instantly one hit KOing the target, regardless of how much HP it has left, how many defense boosts it has, or how many screens the opponent has set up. But these moves rarely see usage in VGC despite the hypothetical value they bring to a team. But that doesn't mean that Oko moves have never been relevant. So today, let's discuss a few times Oko moves were relevant in competitive Pokemon, but before we do that, do me a favor and leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn notifications because I bring you daily competitive Pokemon content, and stay tuned for a word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Ewin. Ewin Racing is a company that I've actually worked with in the past, and trust me when I tell you that the quality and price of their products is unmatched. I've always been really hesitant to buy a gaming chair in the past because I've heard that they weren't actually super comfortable or last very long. Well, a year ago, when Ewin sent me their Champion Series office chair for an ad spot, they definitely squashed those fears in me. This thing has an incredible build quality, and I've actually been using mine since they sent it to me with no detectable wear or tear on it. This thing is rated for big boys too, being able to hold up to 400 pounds, and is made from breathable perforated leather. As far as comfort goes, not only are the armrests adjustable, but I've slept in this bad boy from time to time. Look at how this thing reclines. I mean, with the adjustable pillows for your neck and back support, you already know you'll be comfy whether you're playing games or taking a nap like I do from time to time. It isn't hard to build either. The whole assembly for the chair took me just over a half hour to get through, so if I could do it, just about anyone could. This is definitely a chair that gets me through those long live streams, and it's been a reliable throne during those eight hour long tournament runs. But Ewan decided to step it up from there. This time they've actually sent me their second edition ergonomic gaming desk. Take a look at my old desk. Disgusting. Well, look at this glow up. Literally, it glows. Like, I, I keep mine set to purple when I have the RGB lights on, though I do tend to turn them off from time to time. The customizable LED light colors and patterns mean that you can customize this thing to fit just about any gaming space and give it more personality. Build-wise, this thing stands up to the chair in terms of quality. It's a nice weight for the size of it, and it's super sturdy. I've got three monitors and my PC on this thing, and it's never so much as wobbled under all that weight. It's also got a really satisfying texture across it to make sure that things don't slip off of the table. It's the perfect height for me too. I never find myself compromising my posture to write out the scripts for these videos like the one that you're watching right now. I mean, look at me go, writing what you're hearing me say right now. No, really, that's me writing the script, and I look super comfy. Like I said, these products are a phenomenal value and build quality, especially for the price. The desk will run you $419, but it's on sale at the time that I make this video for $329. The chair will run you $479 normally, but with that sale right now, it's going to go down to $369. And on top of that, you can click through my affiliate link below and use my code MB for an extra 20% off. This will actually bring the price of the desk down to just $263 and the chair down to just $295. So don't miss out on this deal. Thanks again to Ewin Racing for sponsoring this video and let's get back into it. Before we talk about Oko move relevancy, let's talk about the mechanics of them. Obviously, Oko moves can't just one-shot a Pokemon with no drawbacks. As a matter of fact, the drawback could be considered having to give up a more reliable move to roll the dice on an Oko. Oko moves have a flat 30% accuracy when two Pokemon are at an equal level, which is always the case in modern VGC, as all Pokemon are set to level 50. There are no ways to increase the accuracy of Oko moves because of how they're programmed into the game. The only ways to guarantee landing one of them are by using using a move like Lock-On, which guarantees the next move hits by bypassing the accuracy check, or by somehow getting the ability No Guard swapped onto the Pokemon using the move. Effectively, you can only have the 30% chance to hit or commit to a lot of setup to guarantee that the move hits. Neither of these see much play though, because as I stated earlier, the major drawback of Oko moves is having to run them in the first place over a more reliable move. By also putting Lock-On on the move set, you're now committing half of a Pokemon's moves to the Oko strategy. On the other hand, by trying to get no guard onto the Pokemon, you're not only committing more move slots to the strategy, but multiple turns of the game and multiple Pokemon in your team. It's far more reliable to run just about any other strategy if you want to see results, but there are a number of pretty interesting exceptions to this rule. Let's start off with a really old one. I had trouble finding some details on this, but the winner of the Japan National Championships in 2010 actually ran an event-exclusive Suicune that had access to Sheer Cold. There's footage of this online, and you can actually see the player land a sheer cold onto Togekiss turn 1 of game 2, which the crowd really seemed to enjoy. Obviously I don't have a lot of info on this and I couldn't track down a team report in time for the video, but I just wanted to include this for posterity. 
In 2014, Aaron Trailer top cut the World Championships with a sheer cold assault vest Lapras. According to Aaron's team report, Lapras was the MVP of the team and the bulkiest of the Pokemon in the format. He goes on to explain in his team report that Lapras was meant to be able to usually score a KO versus Garchomp with a freeze dry and get 3 hit KO'd by Mega Manectric Thunderbolt. He also explains that there are a few situations where Sheer Cold is mathematically better than Hydro Pump. To quote him directly, In a 1v1 duel, say versus a slower Aegislash, I am more likely to grab a KO than I would be if I didn't run Sheer Cold. Sheer Cold also gave me a stronger matchup against Mega Venusaur, Tyranitar, and other Lapras. He includes the math saying that the odds of hitting 1 in 1 Sheer Colds is 30%, 1 in 2 Sheer Colds is 51%, and 1 in 4 Sheer Colds is 75.9%, where the odds of hitting 1 Hydro Pump is 80%, 2 Hydro Pumps is 64%, 3 Hydro Pumps is 51.2%, and all 4 Hydro Pumps is 40%. So effectively, it's much easier just to land the Oko rather than chip away at a Pokemon with a bunch of Hydro Pumps. And that really summarizes why some Pokemon can afford to run Oko moves while others can't. Lapras is fat enough to throw out as many Hail Mary Sheer Colds as it needs to to try to secure a KO in dire situations. There are some times when that glimmer of hope of landing a Sheer Cold will end up becoming its win condition. Moving Moving forward a few years, in 2017, we actually have quite a few examples from Generation 7. One of the most notable is that Fissure was actually a fairly common move to run on Gastrodon. Gastrodon was one of the strongest Pokemon in VGC 2017 due to its wide variety of utility moves and phenomenal bolt. Not to mention it had only one weakness in grass moves and had the ability Storm Drain. However, it did have one major flaw in Pokemon Sun and Moon. Its best ground move, Earth Power, wasn't available as a TM or Tutor move, so it lost access to it entirely. Besides running Earthquake, which wasn't the best on Gastrodon, it had to either run Mudshot for reliable special damage, or use Fissure as a filler move that could double as a very strong Tectonic Rage. Due to Gastrodon's great bulk and longevity, Fissure actually wasn't that bad of an option. It wasn't uncommon in 2017 for games to be pretty long and drawn out, with Pokemon like Arcanine, Celesteela, Chansey, and Tapu Fini running around. So Gastrodon was actually able to throw out Fissures and Fish for KOs versus bulky Pokemon it wasn't able to deal with otherwise. You were more likely to land the hit than not if you went for the 30% roll all 8 times, kinda like what Aaron mentioned in the Lapras example. As the format developed in 2017, people slowly started to figure out that not only could Kartana get away with running little to no attack investment given its sky high base attack stat, but it could also invest those EVs into its special defense and HP stats with an assault vest to begin surviving Tapu Koko Thunderbolts and Tapu Lele Psychics. It could even live special fire coverage from Pokemon like Gyarados which would run it specifically for beating Kartana. Kartana already had 3 moves it would run alongside Detect or Protect on its Focus Sash set, so what would the 4th move be? It already had access to Grass Stab and Leaf Blade and Steel Stab and Smart Strike and a strong fighting coverage move in Sacred Sword. It could run something like Night Slash for hitting Ghost and Psychic types, but Leaf Blade was only 5 base power weaker than a super effective Night Slash after the Stab Multiplier. Some players actually settled on Guillotine. While Kartana didn't have the same longevity as typical Oko move Pokemon, it was able to justify running the normal Oko move as sort of a Hail Mary to pick up KOs on Pokemon that it couldn't hit very hard like Arcanine or Celesteela. It was also an invaluable tool versus Evasion Chansey teams which started to pick up around this time. Basically, if Kartana was going to have to either go for the Crit Sacred Sword or a Guillotine to win the match, the chances of landing Guillotine were much better. Are you starting to see a trend with how people use Oko moves in competitive Pokemon? Another non-traditional Okomu Pokemon that saw a good result in 2017 was actually Smeargle, because despite losing access to Dark Void, it just can't help but be the worst thing ever. Jawani top cut Vancouver 2017 with a Smeargle running Wide Guard, Fake Out, Follow Me, and Guillotine. According to him, the Guillotine didn't really make a difference, but what did was his Sheer Cold Alala Ninetales that he happened to run on the same team. It scored him a crucial win in Round 5 of Swiss versus his opponent Jolie Hamill, which had he not hit the move would have cost him the game and and his top cut result. This wasn't an easy run either, as during this tournament, Jawani faced off versus Gavin Michaels, Aaron Zhang, and Ray Rizzo, who is a three-time world champion. VGC had an explosion of popularity in 2020 with the release of Sword and Shield. Because of the game being on a mainline console with an HDMI port, more players were able to stream the game, growing the scene and having even more minds in the pool to experiment and develop the metagame. One of the most notable Oko move users in 2020 was actually Excadrill. This is because of the new Dynamax mechanic, which would double the Pokemon's HP and turn all of their moves into a super powerful attack that would have a secondary effect. One of the most valuable was Max Strike. 
Assault Vest Excadrill were able to run Horn Drill as their fourth move, so when they Dynamax, they'd have access to a super powerful 150 base power max strike for speed control and major damage. Once the Dynamax ended, Horn Drill served a very similar purpose to Guillotine Cartana, being a last ditch effort to secure a KO. Speaking of which, in Series 7 and 9 of Gen 8 VGC, Assault Vest and Cartanas would still run Guillotine for the exact same purpose, powerful speed control and last ditch knockouts. Gigantamax Lapras was a very niche pick for earlier series in VGC 2020, but it did have a huge tool at its disposal that no other Pokemon did. This was G-Max Resonance. This ice move would deal major damage to the opponent and then set up Aurora Veil to bolster the team's defenses for the next 5 turns. G-Max Lapras teams would typically aim not only to set up the screens, but score massive damage or even KOs with the move. Due to Lapras' natural bulk, as we mentioned earlier in the 2014 section, it could spam sheer colds while not G-Maxed as it sits on the field, or use it to make G-Max Resonance 150 base power. Sheer Cold became a fairly standard move to fit onto Lapras because of how much value it brought to the Pokemon. Speaking of water types that ran Oko moves, there was actually a really interesting mono water team, in quotes, that won an event with Horn Drill Seeking. Mythos 94 built a team that looked like it was a mono water team on the surface, which it used to its advantage. The team consisted of G Max Lapras, Tentacruel, Dracovish, Gyarados, Seeking, and an Urshifu Dark, which would surprise the opponents as on the surface they would assume it was a Rapid Strike variant. The Sea King actually had Lightning Rod to win the Lapras Ditto, as Lapras would typically run Thunder to hit the opposing Lapras with Max Lightning. Sea King would be able to switch in on this with Lightning Rod, absorb the hit, and get a special attack boost. On this Sea King, he also ran Ice Beam, Scald, Protect, and Horn Drill. As a matter of fact, he ended up winning the Circuito Galar tournament, which had over 900 competitors. It's an honestly insane team that I can't really do justice to in this video, but there's a lot of information talking about this run and the team, and there's like a breakdown of it on YouTube, so I'll be sure to link those in the description down below for anyone interested in a deep dive on that one. Moving on to Generation 9, at the release of the generation, not only did we get a ton of new Pokemon with the potential to viably run Oko moves, but a new bug in online battles that made Oko moves devastating. It didn't take long for players to realize that, in online battles, every game had the exact same RNG seed. To put it simply, this means that if a Pokemon used Heat Wave turn 1, the exact same outcome would happen for every turn 1 Heat Wave they played, because the RNG seed was the exact same. If I recall correctly, Heat Wave would actually always miss the Pokemon on the right slot, but I'm not certain. This also meant that it could be abused to guarantee an Oka move connects with an opposing Pokemon turn 1, and players began using Sheer Cold Chen Pao for effectively a free KO. Luckily, at this time we didn't yet have the online ranked ladder enabled, and a bug fix came out shortly after the game's released. But yeah, you could basically manipulate the RNG in peer-to-peer -peer battles to land Oko moves. This led to unofficial tournaments temporarily banning Oko moves since this was obviously a bug. And for those of you wondering, we just kinda had to accept the other stuff, heatwave misses and burns and everything that came with the fixed RNG seed. The final example we'll be covering today is our most recent. Don Dozo is a water type Pokemon that, when paired with a commander Tatsugiri, would get a sharp Omni Boost and have its signature move order up raise one of its stats every time it was used. Along with this, it had the ability unaware, which means that it would also ignore all target Pokemon stat changes. No number of nasty plots or swords dances would matter to the Don Dozo. You also couldn't wall it out with an iron defense as it would just bypass it and get a KO. This led to a pretty big issue in tournaments. Due to its popularity, it wasn't uncommon to see Don Dozo mirror matches come down to game timer decisions since neither Don Dozo could possibly break the other until some players began to run Fissure on their Don Dozo. With all the time in the world to go for Fissures against opposing Don Dozos, you are more likely to hit the move than not, so this was actually pretty viable in the mirror match. This did fall out of style over time though, as players began to relegate the task of beating opposing Don Dozos to other Pokemon on the team. But Oko move coverage still remains somewhat relevant in VGC 2023 at the time of this video, as there are still a good amount of Pokemon that could tack on an Oko move as a last ditch effort for beating opposing defensive Pokemon like Don Dozo or Garganical, which ran rampant in the format. Some examples include Guillotine on Assault Vest King Gambit, Fissure Garganical, and I'm just gonna make a bold prediction for Series 3. Fissure Ting Lu? I don't know, we'll see how that one ages. But that was a brief and not at all comprehensive history of a few times that Oko moves were relevant and successful in competitive Pokemon. Thanks for everyone who helped me gather this information, and a very special thank you to my Patreon supporters that keep this channel going and to help me pay the editors. You can see your name at the end of my videos and gain access to exclusive bonus videos at the start of each week by supporting me on Patreon, becoming a Twitch subscriber, or becoming a YouTube member by clicking the join button below this video. If you don't want to do that, just know that leaving a like, a comment, and subscribing does more than enough to support the channel. 
Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.